happening to you. Okay, so, you know, um, this is a very good chance for us to listen to Yorgos Kalis. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Subir Sena from the Department of Development Studies at SOAS, University of London. Uh, welcome to our webinar series, where we have so far focused on how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected development worldwide. Thank you for making time to listen to this important lecture today. It is my pleasure to welcome Yorgos Kalis, Professor of Political Ecology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, speaking on the topic of limits, degrowth, and environmental justice. Uh, Yorgos is one of the world's foremost scholars of degrowth, an idea that has caught on in debates on climate change and environmental politics and policy, and is now also influencing debates within development studies. Yorgos' early academic training is in chemistry and environmental engineering from Imperial College London. After working with the European Union in different capacities, most notably on the European Union Water Framework Directive, uh, Yorgos took a PhD in environmental studies at the University of the Aegean in Greece. He has been a fellow at the University of California at Berkeley, where he has worked with the eminent ecological economist Robert Norgard. We were lucky to have Yorgos as a research fellow at our department at SOAS in 2015-16. For more than a decade since his arrival back in Barcelona, Yorgos has been writing about degrowth and his books and articles are among the most cited works on this topic. Apart from numerous books, the latest of which is Limits, Why Malthus Was Wrong and Why Environmentalists Should Care from Stanford University Press in 2019, he has written in and has been interviewed in major newspapers across the world, and his writings have been translated into a dozen languages, maybe more. They have massive implications of, for how development and growth are thought about and practiced. Before I give the floor to him, let me remind you that as with previous webinars, this one also will be recorded and a recording will be placed on the department YouTube channel in the coming days. Also, please post questions in the chat. Uh, Yorgos and I will pick them up after he finishes speaking. So let me now uh, pass the floor over to Yorgos. Welcome once again. Uh, we are really looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Subir. And uh, you know, I've, I've made many Zoom presentations as all of you, I guess, these days. That's the first one that uh, started wrong, but you know, <laughs> and uh, I think I'm going to survive it. Uh, let me let me share if I can um, if I can share my screen. Yes, perfect. So that's my presentation, which starts with a nice uh, with a nice live image of a protest in Athens, Greece, uh, from the good old days when we thought uh, we're gonna change the world. Uh, this was before Syriza was elected, it was around, it was after it was elected. Then we caught up with reality and we saw it was much more difficult to change things within uh, the European Union. But it's still an image that for me captures the spirit uh, of what I want to talk about, which is environmental justice. Uh, so I'm going to focus on three ideas for my research. Uh, it kind of uh, captures uh, the research that I've done the last could say 10 or 12 years since I became professor in Barcelona, for which uh, a very formative period, although short, uh, short but formative was the one year I passed as a Leverkusen visiting professor at SOAS, where uh, many of the ideas that you're gonna hear here, my book on limits that I'm gonna talk about, and also my first book on degrowth were conceived. Uh, this was the place where I motivated. This is where I decided to write the books. And this is where I started working on them. So I'm really happy to, to be virtually back at SOAS. I'm going to communicate uh, three ideas. They might seem a little bit disjointed, but they are not. I hope uh, you will see me interweaving the connections. The first idea is that limits and unlimited growth are two sides of the same coin that perpetuates injustices in the name of progress. We've come to think of the debates about uh, growth and limits as two, two opposite poles. And I'm going to argue that to one extent, a particular understanding of limits and growth are two sides of the same coin. I'm going to then talk about uh, why the overdeveloped economies of Europe and North America, to be a little bit geographically specific and not use uh, the global north or high income countries, why they need to degrow. And then I'm going to finish uh, by saying why, how I understand environmental and climate injustices uh, as systemic features of capitalist growth. 
Uh, along this uh, presentation, I'm gonna give you, uh, let's say, snapshots from different uh, fieldwork experiences that I have that I work uh, with water and uh, uh, land use uh, conflicts uh, and my more macro ecological economic uh, work. So it's gonna be a little bit of a travel through my own uh, personal research uh, trajectory these years which I hope I will uh, be able to illustrate uh, with some uh, formative fieldwork experiences. First of all, a few definitions. Uh, we're not always for all, everyone from the same field or trained in the same thing, so it's good to start with uh, some working definitions. And by environmental justice, I mean a fair and equitable share of environmental goods and damages, crucially a fair share of the cost of climate change, what we might call climate justice. Now, when I said overdeveloped economies, I didn't use this term uh, accidentally. I meant those economies that have used more than their fair share of the planet in terms of resources and energy. And by degrowth, uh, apart from a general critic to the idea of a one-way future consisting only of growth, I mean, and more specifically, a slowing down of uh, the part of the economies of production and consumption that it's environmentally damaging and it's part of how the overdeveloped economies are condemning the rest of the world into a future of uh, climate and more generally environmental and planetary breakdown. Uh, so the, the progress will be my three ideas followed by a short conclusion where I bring the things together. So let me start with a formative uh, fieldwork experience. If you hear any babies crying around the, the way, I think it's the it's the Zoom situation of our days. I have uh, two twin daughters, one year old, so it's really difficult uh, to keep them guarded. And uh, our house here in Barcelona is not very big, so you might hear them scream here and there, but everything is under control, don't worry. Uh, so the first idea, limits and unlimited growth as two sides of the same coin that perpetuates injustices in the name of progress. And my formative experience is uh, from Ata de Pera, which is a small town a few kilometers north of our campus, uh, outside of Barcelona. If you sit at the town square for a coffee, you would think you are in any other uh, Spanish village. It looks like a Spanish village. Yet this is the town with the highest income in the whole of Spain. If you walk off the square, as I walked when I first visited the place, uh, together with a team of researchers that we did this project I'm gonna talk about, uh, you'll find yourself in a Spanish Beverly Hills. It's full of villas with high walls, angry dogs, swimming pools, and ceaseless sprinklers. Uh, the locals will tell you that uh, Sakira and Pique live somewhere around there, but I've heard that about all the post suburbs of Barcelona, so no one really knows where Sakira and Pique live, but it's the kind of place where Sakira would live, you can imagine what I mean. Uh, I was there back in 2010 when I was fresh in Barcelona, and I was there with a team of conservation scientists and historians, and we were studying water conflict and land use during Spain's civil war and Franco's uh, dictatorship. Uh, we did the research first of the city archives to find the information related to this water and land conflicts. We collected oral histories uh, from elders and we documented uh, with CIS, that's an example here, and the satellite images, the conversion of what used to be an agrarian landscape, you can see it here in the 1940s, into a leafy suburb uh, my conservation scientist friends were interested in this transformation, not that it's urbanization, but at the same time, it's a peculiar greening where an agrarian landscape, which was drier, it's transformed into this leafy suburb. You can't really see the suburb, but this white dot you see on the 2007 picture is the type of villas you saw in my picture. And uh, we were asking as a team of researchers, together with historians, how did this happen? And most importantly, and that's the part where I came in, but that was my expertise at the time, what was the role of water and controlling water in this process of this peculiar elite uh, suburbanization and transformation of the landscape? In our story that we published at the journal Economic, Ecological Economics, we found that landed elites privatized water after the civil war, the Spanish civil war, by controlling by controlling water, they managed to finally kick the peasants off uh, the common lands, parceling fields for real estate. There was a perennial conflict between peasants and landowners, and landowners always wanted to push a, a 
kind of uh, early touristification and suburbanization on the place. And we saw that these conflicts came at, uh, at their peak and they were resolved violently uh, during the Spanish Civil War. And it was Franco's guns that killed uh, alternatives both for the water system and the land use uh, distribution in the area of the Republicans and of the peasants, that the Republican and peasant parties were related at the time in Catalonia. And we explain in our article how this violent, uh, primary violent force of, uh, you might call it uh, primitive accumulation or dispossession uh, with the force of the guns, made possible an urbanization of the countryside that from the today's perspective seems natural and almost inevitable. If you ask even locals, they will tell you, yes, that was meant to happen here. You know, it's a beautiful place. It was supposed to be a suburb for its people to pass initially their summers and then make it their, uh, their homes. Uh, Madalena here, we did an oral history, as I told you, remembers how her family was forced out to make space for uh, vacation homes. Only few owned the land, she says, and they sold the entire thing for second residences. We were all sharecroppers. We had nothing of our own, and they forced us out from everywhere. That was about it. She was born in 1933. She talks about the process that starts around then in her childhood and it's completed in the 1950s. Uh, Mingo here, another uh, uh, from a sharecropping family born in 1930, he says, we did nothing and they kicked us out from our home. The owner, which was also the town's mayor, the owner of the land of his family, told to my father, it does not matter whether you have a contract or not, it is useless, houses are houses. That's exactly how he put it. This is a little bit to give you the feeling of the place and what happened there. What struck me during uh, our research there uh, as a water scholar, someone who was interested in water, was how this violence and injustice was erased from memory by a hegemonic story of progress. Even the people who suffered from the violence would tell you today that at least it was for the better, you know? And this progress was defined as a victory in a war against nature and against scarcity, uh, primarily water scarcity. So there was a discourse of progress as more and more water. And here, aside from the work of the history of the town, that is, looked, is, is written from a local historian who is also critical, let's say, of Franco and the Francoist regime. But even him would write, in reality, this town has become a new town. All this wonder of progress has been possible thanks to water. And let's pray to God. He's Catholic. He's anti-Francoist, but Catholic, apparently. The flow of rivers is maintained and increased every day. Where do these rivers go? They go mostly to swimming pools we found uh, with the research we did there. Time and again, I found in the archives that elite, even at the time of this conflict, sold the story of water as being naturally limited, legitimating their projects of expansion while presenting themselves as saviors in a battle against the common enemy of scarcity. Yet Mata de Pera, we argue in the article, with some 675 millimeters of rain every year, is not by any means an arid place. Water was scarce, we argue, for real estate development. But this development was not natural or necessary. It was a political and economic project. Elites throughout the time told the story of natural limits, I came to realize through this research, to justify their plans of unlimited urban growth. And that's a lesson that I developed into a bigger story uh, with my subsequent research that started actually in the year that I spent at SOAS and I want to talk about. Uh, so in my recent book, I engage with the, with the story that since the 1970s, environmental debates are trapped in a supposed binary. On the one hand, we have the supposed Malthusians who defend limits against economists or eco-modernists who defend growth. That's the story I was trained as an ecological economist of the debate of the limits to growth taking place since the uh, 1970s. In my book, Limits, that I published last year by Stanford University Press, I argue instead that limits to growth and unlimited growth are two sides of the same coin. Like in Mata de Pera, a specter of limits constantly is mobilized to justify capitalism, otherwise senseless and unjust pursuit of unlimited growth. Consider the myth of scarcity I write in the book, the central foundation of mainstream neoclassical economics. Our wants, economists tell us in their models and in their stories that they teach us if we are unlucky to study mainstream economics, our wants are theoretically limitless. Therefore, the world is by definition limited. Don't worry though, we are told. 
We can always allocate resources efficiently, and that's our job as economists, to find how to allocate resources efficiently, so as to grow the economy and satisfy ever more wants, while always living within a planet of scarcity. Turning this history of economic thought upside down, I show in my book how a first defense of unlimited growth in the name of limits is found in Malthus' infamous essay on population. And it was a lunch that I had with Gareth Dale, a scholar who first wrote this counterintuitive story of what Malthus argued in the, uh, in the essay, a lunch I had while at SOAS and a friend I made while I was in London that brought to my attention this alternative reading of Malthus that I developed in my book. And I think it's a very different story than the one we are constantly taught about what Malthus said and what he argued. Uh, in my book, I show that Malthus is supposedly a prophet of limits and the uh, overpopulation. But if you go and actually read the essay, because most of us, let's be honest, we don't read the actual essay of Malthus, no? We read the stories about the essay and we say, okay, good luck now going and read the actual Malthus essay. Now, like we don't read, many of us don't read the Wealth of Nations. I have to accept that I know a lot about Adam Smith, but I haven't read yet the Wealth of Nations. And I haven't read it because I didn't want to make a research intervention of the Wealth of Nations, but I wanted to make a research intervention on Malthusianism and Malthus. And I did read the essay very carefully. And uh, if you do that, uh, you will see that a lot of what you've heard about this essay is very different, actually. So Malthus, for example, did not think that there are any limits to food whose production, he wrote, may increase forever. He didn't think also that there are any limits to commodities either. He said we can create them to as great uh, quantities as we want. And a happy nation is one uh, whose population grows as close as possible to a geometric rate. Economic models today, like Malthus at his time, assume that humans have unlimited uh, wants, that we maximize consumption or utility in the disciplines jargon today. Likewise, Malthus, the first professor of economics, actually, Assume that our nature is to have children without limits, even as people around him and for centuries planned their families and the size of their families pretty well. Assuming that geometric growth uh, is natural, Malthus constructed the fat a fantasy world of eternal scarcity, one where, as he wrote, and I think this phrase captures the whole essence of his argument, uh, there is not enough for everyone to have a decent share. And that's basically the dictum of economics ever since Malthus. The poor in this Malthusian world are those who by the nature of things are left without a piece of the pie. Don't help them, he warned. Only the fear of hunger pushes them to work hard and grow the pie for everyone, including themselves. Increase the produce of the country, he wrote, and here is the prophet of growth. Increase the produce of the country and, and this will help them. Any other way of helping the poor will be cruel and tyrannical. And by that he meant the redistribution that was taking place right yeah, at that time uh, in the French Revolution. So against the idea of redistribution a la French Revolution, he wanted economic growth. If this sounds familiar, it should be familiar. That's economics since then. By turning capitalism, social production of scarcity into the natural state of things, economists ever since Malthus explain away the continuing presence of poverty amidst plenty. There is simply not enough, they tell us, not yet at least. We want to have to work harder and grow the economy one notch more. In my book, I claim that environmentalists emphasizing the limitedness of Earth play into this game of economists. If the world is limited, it is, natural, it's, uh, it, it is the natural response. Uh, what the natural response was, it has always been escape and conquest, growth and colonization, geoengineering and landing in Mars. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the moment environmentalists supposedly really realized we live in a limited planet was the very moment we were escaping this planet uh, to go to moon now. It's a constant interplay in dialectic between limits and escape, limits and growth. I argue instead in the book that only when we own, and by we, I mean environmentalists, the choice of limits and stop attributing limits to a stingy nature or our unquenchable selves, will we start sharing and finally limiting ourselves within an abundant other ways and the generous planet. Indeed for radical environmentalists from the romantic movement, which who were the harshest critics of Malthus at his time, uh, to the anarcho-feminists of Emma Goldman, to 1970s Greens or the degrowth movement, 
today, I would say, limits are not an undesirable external imposition. They are a moral and political project that goes hand in hand with equality and justice. I call this a project of collective self-limitation. Society structured on an instinct of limit, not unlimited expansion. If our needs, our consumption, our reproduction can be limited, then scarcity is a myth. Everyone can and must have a decent share because there is already enough against what Malthus said. And the hero in, in my book is Emma Goldman, who actually was arguing for the right of women to control their bodies, control how many children they have, and not because we were running out of things or the planet could not hold so many of us, but he said, because only this way we're going to stop the capitalist machine that wants us women to produce a cheap workforce. That's the only way to stop the imperial machines that want us to produce soldiers. And that's also the only way we can have to enjoy sex without being uh, disciplined by the yoke of motherhood. So it was a liberatory movement based on a self-limitation, limiting something in order to liberate ourselves from something, liberate ourselves from from the yoke of motherhood, liberating ourselves uh, from capitalism. In my book also, I read classical Greece. Uh, I'm Greek, by the way, and we Greeks like to go back to classics uh, every now and then. I was told that this is not very cool to do in this era that Greece is considered as the hard binger of uh, Euro Europe and colonization, but uh, I still think that Greece, we're not responsible for the colonization of the Anglos. So I still, uh, reclaim uh, my right as a Greek to go back to some good things that uh, people who lived in the same territory with me, I don't know if I'm their descendant or not, I don't think so. But anyways, I, I like to go back to some good ideas that I had. And one of them I think is that they took limits seriously. Uh, ancient Greeks invented money and uh, they lived through the first disasters of compound uh, debt. They developed in response, I saw in the book, a moral philosophy of limitedness. Democracy, tragedy, and their ethic of moderation, which was uh, proliferating everywhere, were all institutions, uh, I argue, of self-limitation. A culture of limits and institutions of limits that we so badly lack in our era of runaway global warming. A combination of sufficiency and egalitarian sharing is what I understand as degrowth. And I use here a, a slogan for degrowth that has been attributed to Gandhi, although it, it's not Gandhi, but it captures Gandhi and thought, which is living simply so that others may simply live, not living simply just to avoid climate breakdown or living simply uh, so that we have a, we live a happier life, but also that we give space to other others to live. The root of these uh, ideas of the growth uh, are interconnected, I think, with economics and ideas that come from other parts of the world, from Gandhi and Kumarapa in India. Andean notions of when we were Eastern or African philosophies. These are all concepts and ideas that have been covered in this wonderful book uh, by a Cisco Tarian colleagues, the pluriverse. And I would put the growth, not as the overarching uh, keyword of this pluriverse, but one, uh, one that has been created in Mediterranean Europe, uh, a Western uh, keyword, uh, that it's one among the many keywords that we can use to think about alternatives to a one-way future of development-based, uh, growth-based development. So let me move to my second argument about the growth. And here I will change a little bit and start uh, giving numbers and figures and graphs. So make a little bit of a mindset change. And then in my last part of the presentation, I'm going to go back to political ecology. I'm a little bit uh, uh, binary in this way of thinking. So I do a little bit of ecological kind of economics. It's not exactly economics, but it's kind of economics. And then I do a political ecology. So for someone else, this might feel a little bit uh, a switch of speeds in the in the presentation, but please bear with me because I think uh, the figures and the and the arguments will be slightly interesting. So a recent study by Jason Hickel finds that G8 nations are responsible for 85% of global CO2 emissions in excess of 350 ppm. And climatologists Alice Bose Larkin and Kevin Anderson calculate that high-income nations must reduce their emissions 10% every year in line with the first year of a two degrees carbon budget. Uh, so if uh, high income nations are serious about doing their bid uh, about climate change, they have to reduce emissions 10% every year. And yet these same economies want to grow two to 3% every year, doubling every 20 years or so, 10 times bigger by the end of the century, straight into uh, an irrational infinity. This is what the graph of global GDP looks uh, like at the growth rate of 3% each year. It's good to remind what 
this innocent 3% each year looks like. Compare 2018 to 2100. Look what we expect, <clears throat> not just the circulation of capital, difficult does it be to be absorbed and create investments to be, but imagine also the circulation of resources and energy that will be to sustain this economy. Uh, compound growth is the madness of economic reason, David Harvey wrote, wrote, and I couldn't agree more than that. So maybe green growth then, increasing GDP at this crazy infinity rate, which is crazy, so it's not possible. But OK, there is this whole rhetoric of uh, green growth, increasing GDP while reducing resources and emissions. In a review of recent resource models, we find with Jason Hickel that in all scenarios uh, available, by the UNEP and by others who claim that green growth is possible. But if you look at their actual scenarios, global resource use increases alongside the GDP till 2050, as it have done more or less until now. So no one uh, foresees any separation between GDP and uh, resource use. So no, not greening at all. Growth, yes, but not green growth. IPC's climate models, Square growth with the 1.5 degrees that we agreed in summer in Paris, only by assuming, and that's the recent innovation, it's to imagine that there are some technologies, unproven and untested for the time being, of negative emissions, that it's bioenergy with carbon capture, that at some point in the future will start taking carbon out of the atmosphere. This is the brown and yellow parts you see in these scenario graphs, but basically take out carbon that otherwise is overshot in all of these uh, scenarios. Uh, whether this will be possible, it's, I mean, it hasn't been tested at any scale. And the best calculations is that just the land we will need to do these forestation projects will be three, three times the size of India. So you can ima imagine about what land use and food sovereignty conflicts we are talking about if this was ever to happen. happen. Tellingly, the only IPCC model, and that's the first one, the P1, that doesn't uh, assume so much of these uh, untested technologies, uh, assumes instead a dramatic uh, degrowth in energy use, uh, unlike anything seen in the past. Ecomodernists uh, celebrate the supposed dematerialization, they call it, of high income countries, pointing to redu reductions in domestic resource use, the red lines alongside GDP growth, the blue lines. Yet this is an artifact of globalization. If you look at the material footprints, the green lines, uh, that is the total resources that used in a nation to produce the good the nation consumes, that is including the imports, including the goods that they are produced in China and the resources they use and that we then import, then you see no decoupling whatsoever from GDP. So we see the same picture, resource use and GDP growing uh, hand in hand. And this makes sense because in a globalized economy, we would expect the picture within the nations to represent the same pictures that we saw for the world as a whole. As a whole. Now it is true that uh, 21 countries, including UK that you might have read in the news, US or France, have reduced their carbon footprints between 2000 and 2014, even though their economies grew. Uh, and this is after taking imports into account. But note that these reductions were close to 1% to 2% per year, nowhere near the necessary 10% uh, that we said is needed year after year. And mind you also that all these economies experienced low GDP growth uh, since 2000. This is why we called off a period after 2008 of secular stagnation. So the average GDP growth is close to 1% to 2% average per year. If the growth was 3%, there wouldn't be any reduction in carbon emissions, which was 1% every year. If the global economy recovers from COVID the way it did in 2008, then we will overshoot uh, the two degree uh, climate uh, temperature change paths within a decade. We foreseen models we made with Alyosha Slamarkasak, my student and Dan O'Neill, a colleague from Leeds. Even an ambitious global mitigation plan, what we call here a green deal, the yellow line in our graph, uh, resembling a little bit the green deal of the European Union, fails to keep global emissions within two degrees, the blue shaded area. The only recovery path that could stay within the envelope of two degrees of climate change, of temperature change is the green line in the graph. And this is a scenario that combines fast decarbonization, reduced energy use, and crucially, zero GDP growth in the global north. So that's a really challenging scenario, but that's what we try. These challenges that we try to capture with a word that it's not easy to digest, and it's the word degrowth. 
Will lack of growth cause unemployment? How do we finance clean energy without growth? Will inequalities increase? I mean, these are all very valid questions. And unfortunately, it's not the questions that economists uh, mostly are engaged with. Most of them assume growth. I mean, recently I tried to do a project on the Green New Deal without growth, and I talked to very interesting and brilliant heterodox economists. My student talked to brilliant heterodox economists. All of them were surprised by our assumption that we said, okay, let's think how would we finance it if there was no growth? They said, no growth? How is this possible? No, there will be growth because of a Green New Deal. We said, okay, what if there isn't? You know, what, what do we do then? Even, even that was too much to consider. But that's a research agenda I try to push with my colleague. Uh, it's my research agenda on policies for the growth. For example, with Nicholas Asford from the MIT, we showed how a reduction of working hours can increase employment and leisure while reducing emissions. With Tillman Hartley and Jeroen van den Berg, we assessed redistributive policies for increasing the quality without growth. And there are many things and options we can think there from wealth taxes and maximum income limits to a universal basic income or making workers owner, owners of the companies they work for. Now, you might say, okay, nice, nice paper ideas you have there. And of course, the problem with uh, what we are discussing here is not policies, but politics. And no matter how ecologically necessary I might uh, argue or convince you that the growth is, politically, you will still argue it seems impossible. So in a recent book, The Case for the Growth, we try to do a little bit confront this challenge and think of what a, a reasonable political strategy would look like. And we try to articulate uh, the different forms it might take through protest, direct action, reform, and also prefiguration, uh, linking what we call the personal, the communal, and the political. But they are all three levels where we have to act and articulate our actions. And the model we proposed, one of building new common senses, a concept uh, many of you, given that you are at SOAS, you would know that we take from Antonio Gramsci, and how through cultural changes embodied and practiced in the making and defense of new commons and articulating new common senses, we can articulate that into a political project uh, that promotes these commons and creates structures of living without growth. Now, this might sound a little bit theoretical, but of course, we all theorize based on what we experience. And what we've experienced is a tentative, limited, you might call it uh, failed, but what is not failed uh, in this world, <laughs> in this planet, no? Uh, experience of uh, Barcelona in common, the political platform that emerged from the Indignado squares here in Barcelona, and which articulated common senses that they were already diffusing in the alternative economy of the city. Uh, that became a social movement in the squares and then articulated as a political movement, took control of the city and opened uh, new spaces for uh, cooperative and alternative economies in the city. Uh, critics from the right wing call it the party of degrowth. I wish it was the party of degrowth. It, it, it really isn't, but at least it is a party that can inspire us for what the politics of degrowth could look like. Um, and that's just a to show that it articulates many of the common senses that we articulate with our academic work. This is the, an advertisement that uh, the party uh, Barcelona in Comun uh, published last year. And, uh, and it says, uh, there is enough for everyone if we share it. And actually that was the very, the very main thesis of my book Limits, you know, and it hasn't been translated in Spanish or Catalan, so it's not that they took it from me, but it is, I think I took it from the vibes of the city. And that's a little bit to think also of how uh, engaged scholarship might work now, absorbing the ideas that are coming from the places we live. So my th third and final idea, and um, I have 10 minutes I realized to finish, so I have to speed it up, is about environmental and climate injustices as systemic features of capitalist growth, which will not be a surprise for people like you at SOS, but I want a little bit to share with you uh, some of the fieldwork uh, through which I've made this point. So again, to start from a fieldwork experience, this is a picture from the Seyhan River Plain in the southern coast of Turkey, which looks like a pastoral landscape for most of the year. If you walk there in late spring, you will see people as far as your eyes can see, cramped in makeshift tents next to streams, waiting in long lines to use restrooms, working 10 hours a day for $1 an hour till the dead heat of the summer, Seasonal migrants of Kurdish origin, uh, they come there from the eastern depths of Turkey and they harvest watermelons 
making barely enough money to pass the winter with their families uh, back home. Uh, my student, uh, Turkish uh, student, Etem Kanturhan, he traveled to the safe and driven basin and talked to workers under the suspicious eyes of the local police, but they don't like to talk to Kurdish uh, workers, you can imagine. Uh, we were starting their programs of the UNDP and the Turkish government to help ostensibly seasonal workers adapt to climate change. Extreme heat events were found to cause more heat strokes every year among seasonal workers and diseases thrived in the makeshift settlements. Adaptation uh, of the UNDP and the Turkish government included a cemented settlement for pre-made tents, new bathrooms and the charity clinic where doctors checked workers daily for disease or heat stroke. And workers had to register there with their IDs so that health authorities kept track of them. In our paper, where we reported on this experience and published at Global Environmental Change, we argue that this is not adaptation, but maladaptation. It's adaptation that increases the vulnerability of vulnerable people. And the Turkish government uh, is acting biopolitically, to use a term from Michel Foucault. Its logic is one of controlling the circulation of people and commodities uh, for the profitability of capital. Helping temporary farm workers adapt, indeed, uh, we found would be easy. Uh, the government could give them access to health and benefits available to normal workers. It could remove the intermediaries and let workers unionize and get decent pay. Or it could allow workers, if they wanted, to settle with families for the duration of, of that they wanted in the area. Of course, none of this is allowed to happen and it won't happen because the goal, we argued, is not to help and make more resilient, as the UNDP argues, uh, the seasonal workers, but to keep a cheap, docile and mobile labor. Healthy, just enough to survive the heat and to work in the fields, coming for the growing season and swiftly living after, without settling. Uninsured, paid below the minimum and without complaining. And of course, carefully monitored in case there are any Kurdish agitators. The historical discrimination of ethnic Kurds here meets the logic of capital. Treating seasonal workers exceptionally maintains the prices of Turkish watermelons low enough to be competitive in what is a cutthroat global market. And it maintains that under conditions of climatic change. So capital here we find is adapting well to climate, but not people. Somewhat comparable was the situation we studied in River Evrotas uh, in Southern Greece uh, with my colleague Panagiota Kotsila, where we were studying why malaria eradicated in Greece in the 1970s was making a comeback. Austerity cuts uh, in mosquito control and the hotter climate caused an explosion of new cases of malaria. And the government, right wing at the time, this is Evrotas, the government right wing at the time, and unfortunately also now, uh, blamed the epidemic on seasonal workers from Pakistan, there to pick oranges with quite uh, racist discourses. Our in situ political ecology revealed instead how underpaid seasonal workers who could not afford the exorbitant rents local starts for rooms, lived cramped with family in the marshes where malaria mosquitoes thrived. Lack of access to hospitals and fear of deportation stopped workers from reporting symptoms. Seasonal workers remained invisible until malaria threatened Greece tourism. And there's nothing worse you can do to Greece, to, to the Greek government than threatening the tourist uh, revenue. So then the state uh, took action and targeted the migrants, again, biopolitically, in the same sense that we found in Turkey, othering the migrants and framing the disease as an imported anomaly that should not worry tourists, while using the pretext of a health crisis to control the movements of workers even more tightly, making sure they pick oranges, they are paid low, and then they go. This racialized othering that we observed in Greece, like in Turkey, was not only a matter of nationalist, fascist, or xenophobic mindsets, which of course it was, but it was also functional to capital accumulation and growth. Racism, in other words, keeps the labor of an exploited other cheap. So, so, and this is the paper we published on this. So in my 2018 book, The Growth, uh, conceived and started uh, being written while at SOAS, I politicized, I hope, what an otherwise was up to then an apolitical debate around limits to growth. I showed how from its onset at the factories of Manchester and the plantations of the Americas, economic growth is predicated on the violent exploitation of cheap others, humans and non-humans. Racial, ethnic and gender hierarchies secure an unpaid or underpaid labor force from which surplus is extracted. 
surplus invested to make more surplus, and which is uh, the phase that this takes and the ideology with which it's sold as being to the benefit of everyone is the ideology of economic growth and the ideology of progress, which is also what I encountered in my very first fieldwork that I talked about in Mata de Pere in Catalonia. I didn't talk about a lot about gender, but uh, gender is a, is a core uh, concern in the book and increasingly on my own research and teaching. So the role of undervalued care labor, mostly perform, performed by women unpaid in the household, is crucial in the story of economic growth. And I follow here Silvia Federici's insights, who showed how separating women from the control of the bodies was crucial for capital's original accumulation, as crucial as was the separation of laborers from their commons. And it's very interesting that this separation of women takes place around the period that Malthus uh, is writing. So this is where a little bit before Federici um, locates this process of violent dispossession of women and the violent uh, pre, uh, pro, pro natal policies that capitalist states impose in order to have a population growth that they were lacking and that was putting an obstacle to early capitalism. And it's precisely this population growth that Malthus too wants to maintain. But at the same time, he wants to maintain the poor uh, discipline. And it is interesting to see uh, the links there, you know, how the dispossessions and the over reproduction of uh, human force that capital was uh, needing and was producing uh, was theorized by early apologists of capitalists in terms of growth, in terms of limits and scarcity that we can only respond to with growth. And that was Malthus. Let me close very briefly in the two minutes that I have uh, left by weaving uh, the connections between the different parts of my research I presented here. So if we want to understand social and environmental injustices like the ones I presented here, I argue we have to focus on the systemic force that demands the cheapening of people and their environments. And this force has a name, capitalism, and the cause of the cheapening is the inexorable need of capital to grow without limit, 3% per year, all the way to the madness of infinity. This growth is only possible by shifting costs to racialize the others out of you or to the future. And to this impossible goal of compound growth, more and more is sacrificed. Public health and education systems that we build with so much effort and pain, the very well being of our planet and of our communities, and the very well-being of our descendants. To think of escape routes, we need to start by looking at the actual people fighting to limit capital and growth. And I didn't talk much about that here, apart from the very quick reference to the Barcelona movement. We need to focus on those who struggle to block mines and oil pipelines, those who work for food sovereignty and peasant agriculture, those who reclaim the commons uh, in the cities. And I think an important scholar work uh, here for political ecologists is to think carefully how these disparate fights can be connected and are being connected into a broader social and political movement that finally manages to make openings and bring social, environmental, and climate justice. We might call this a movement on, of a global environmental justice or an environmentalism of the commons. I live. Uh, this open uh, for discussion and uh, I thank you very much for your attention and again I apologize for the technical glitches at the beginning. Thanks. Thank you so much there uh, Yorgos, that was a fabulous talk and uh, so much that you brought in from history and archival research in Spain and wide-ranging in terms of your uh, going back to certain debates all the time from all the way from Malthus. The first question uh, which has been posted, and actually quite interestingly, this, this question was posted before you talked about uh, uh, the sort of, uh, you know, about um, the anti-natalist uh, position. Here is Kasha, she's saying from your mention of Goldman, Emma Goldman, how would you describe the relationship between the concept of degrowth and environmental anti-natalism, the philosophical position that advocates not having biological children in order to limit the detrimental human impact on the environment, for example, the birth strikers. Uh, we could take yeah, a... That, that, <laughs> that's a tough question that I expect from Soas. That's good. <laughs> yes, we thought uh, you might be missing Soas. Uh, so... I was expecting something easier. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just had twins, by the way. 
were a lot to come and I really suffered to have them. I mean, it took me, it took us a lot of time and I'm old, so. Yeah. Uh, so I can't say that I'm not personally an antinatalist and I, I think that the, the most intense happiness I've had in my life is having these two children. So it mm. would be difficult for me to advocate uh, an antinatalism as a position. But what I advocate in my book, uh, what I call self-limitation, it's, it's, it's a posture of, uh, of an instinct of limitation, which means an instinct of each one, each one of us uh, defining a defining our own limits. Um, so carefully thinking, yes, how many children we would like to have or how many children would make sense to have. If none, that's also a, an acceptable posture, although it's not one that I took or that I would take. So my question is to, to put this question of limits at the center. At the center. I think in terms of, uh, uh, of limiting the number of children, uh, <laughs> Uh, we see that in, in, in European countries, this is already happening. I mean, it's, it's very rare that someone would not have these considerations nowadays. Of course, it is, it is, it is a question of uh, women having the right to make this decision. And uh, a birth strike also, I think uh, the way Emma Goldman had decided is, uh, is, a reasonable, is a reasonable tool as long as it has a political dimension. Where I would draw the line would be, I, I wouldn't accept, I mean, it's a longer discussion. I, I would accept it as a political tool or as a political stance of confronting capitalism and uh, the, way, the way Emma Goldman put it. But I would be more reluctant to have it uh, in an environmentalist, uh, let's leave Earth uh, alone mindset, because I think there it can take a potentially more dangerous politically direction. Yeah, sure. Uh, Kasha has just corrected me. She's from Cambridge, not from SOAS. Thank you. Um, and while other people are thinking about the questions, uh, you know, let me just ask a couple of things on, on, you know, on, on two sort of interesting ways in which you seem to be thinking about limits. One is the uh, sort of creative ways in which people might limit themselves. And I think you make a distinction between individual and sort of communal kind of and even global or planetary forms of limitation. And the other is the limitation uh, of nature or of human bodies themselves. Uh, is there a distinction? And particularly uh, in light of, let us say, you know, what has been said about the pandemic at the moment, that we should think in terms of uh, limiting growth in order that there should be boundaries between human populations and, uh, you know, wildlife was one of the uh, suggestions that was made, that we should put limits on capitalist agriculture and so forth. Uh, that, you know, so I, I get very much and I appreciate very much your sort of uh, point with which you started, which was that, uh, you know, sort of limits and growth are not opposite to each other, but are two sides of the same coin. Uh, I just wonder if these are also two sides of the same coin at one level, in the sense that the natural limits, as you suggest, force us to think in terms of more conscious forms of self-limiting. Yes, I like to think of, of our interaction with the natural wor world as co-evolving and also to think of the destruction we bring to a world that it's otherwise abundant. So I, I start from a premise of abundance. Hmm. It's also the way many pre-capitalist civilizations started from and the way they saw the world. So they didn't see it as limited or as scarce. They saw it as abundant. And of course, uh, to realize that we are dis de destroying this abundance, we are destroying it with capitalist agriculture, we are destroying it with uh, climate change, etc. No, so um, so there is a let's say natural science uh, input that it's coming from there, which is documenting our destruction and which is um, informing uh, the quest for our self collective uh, self limitation. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yes. I don't like though, and here I have struggled to convince my fellow environmental, environmentalists, environmental scientists and friends, you know, I don't want to, to, to frame this as a question of natural limits of earth that are asking from us to respect them, you know, uh, because I, I think, I think this, this precise framing of seeing the world as bounded, uh, limited and limiting us in some particular ways, it has been 
part and parcel of the story that I said of capitalism from the very beginning. And within the capitalist civilization that uh, we live, uh, it creates the opposite impetus, which is um, how can we overcome these limits? And th this is the um, this is the constant, uh, this is the prevalent discourse right now. It's from how we can fix climate change with hydrogen energy, nuclear energy, geoengineering, you hear it. And then to the most extreme is like already thinking how we can escape Earth and go to Mars now. There are already people with money and capital who are thinking along these lines. So my question is to put, some people say ethical. I don't like the ethical. I think it's a political question. It's like, what do we want to do? And what do we want to do is to collectively uh, limit uh, uh, limit ourselves and limit capital by limiting ourselves. Thanks. There are two questions for you in the chat if you want to pick up. Uh, there's one from Jules. Uh, how exactly could we avoid the danger of recession in our system in setting the pace for a system decentered from growth? Mm -hmm. And then uh, one from uh, Jing. How uh, do you think that degrowth concept is helpful for achieving low carbon development? Yeah. Uh, no, th these both are, are, are what I'm saying are, are questions. They are research questions. Uh, they are political questions, and they are they are the things that I would like us to talk about. So, as a minimum, I, what I see my role as being is to setting these questions, mm -hmm. so that the other brilliant minds, because my mind is not that brilliant. I mean, it, it is as brilliant as anyone else's in this room, and it's brilliant up to a point. No, so I can't answer everything just because I'm the first. Mm -hmm. I'm one among the first ones that said like. Mm -hmm people you know like compound growth is madness i mean david harvey said it too and many others said it. i like we need to think about the growth it's not possible that we can answer everything to defend that i mean one is the diagnosis we need to talk about that we need to talk about alternatives to growth then it's we, we need to start uh, putting this question so one uh, very good question is like how do you manage without growth and that's a question that the fellow ecological economist peter victor uh, has put down uh, 10 years ago. He approached it as an economist with models, what working time uh, reductions could work and maintain a meaningful employment, even within a uh, contraction of the economy, etc. cetera. Uh, right now, no, recessions are terrible. Uh, I would be stupid to, to say no, no. But the question is like, can we start talking, researching and experimenting with how do we manage uh, in recession times? And this is not just a theoretical concern. Right now, with the COVID lockdowns, this is what's happening. Right now, governments are experimenting with economic tools that they were considered theoretical uh, before and it was only radicals proposing them. They more or less experiment with them in order to maintain the system afloat in a period of forced depression. No? That still hasn't fully reached us. No? So we haven't experienced the Great Depression yet because there are all these tools that somehow manage the system a little bit afloat in this period. Now, how is this done? Is it done with incredible indebtedness? Is it done with a quantitative easing that cannot be maintained uh, beyond these two or three years? It's going to explode after. I don't have the answers, but I'm saying these are the important questions now. How can we manage these periods of contraction um, sustainably? Uh, and, and this is the second question. Is it helpful for achieving low carbon development? Again, it's easier to imagine uh, decarbonization. We think if we get richer and we have more money to spend, etc. But the problem is, the more the economy produces, you know, the more it starts using also the other resources and the other fossil fuels that it uses, while also inventing in renewable energy. That's the story until now. We have renewable energy is growing and also fossil fuels growing together. Uh, so I think yes, the growth, like a slower output of a big part of the economy. Uh, um, plant a uh, contraction of part of the economy that has to, to degrow from fossil fuels to, to big scale uh, infrastructures, etc. Uh, it, is, it is helpful for a low carbon transition. And it will give more time and space for renewable energies also to, to take their space. Uh, there's a question from uh, Priya Roji. Uh, Priya Roji, do you want to... Uh... Yes, unmute. Yes, and there you go. Yes. Yeah, I think it was easier to rather speak as opposed to type it out because it's not yet a developed question. Thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. Um, I guess it's like a challenge I have or a question. The context of climate change is global. So there's only one Earth. Everyone inhabits the same Earth. Using, I, I, I totally get the view of asking those who consume the most carbon and the most resources to reduce those. Mm -hmm. But are we perhaps like only focusing on one part of it 
and saying, well, okay, it's great to reduce, to get these big polluters, et cetera, to decrease and de uh, degrow their economies and thereby reducing their carbon footprints. What impact does that have on, for example, countries like Africa or countries in the global south? Um, should we be using growth as an outcome? So should we rather just be doing the right things instead of continuously trying to measure it? Because what I'm understanding is mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is implement long-term actions to sure. deliver a result over the long term. And like every time, every year, every quarter measuring an outcome, that's mm -hmm. actually short term. So we kind of like mix in the two. And, and mm -hmm. I said, it's, it's not a question or a critique. It's more of a, I have these questions. Um, and to me, like I'm thinking about it more, I'm, I'm from South Africa. So like thinking about it in, a, in an African context, how can we think about, not growth, um, another word, insert new word for whatever that is. To, to me, it's like that would be partly trying to get us there. And degrowth is one of those options or like asking the continent to degrow is that like can, can juxtapose. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Priyada. These are all excellent points. And yes, the, the idea of the growth is not to, it, it, it's not to, to start measuring GDP and trying to degrow it year after year. That's far from, from the idea because it is a critique to the whole mentality of GDP and measuring the economy in terms of GDP. As we know, it's a terrible indicator in many ways. Um, the idea is to getting the right thing done, but uh, it is to getting the right thing done, as you said, uh, with, uh, with, with the honesty uh, that we realize that getting this thing done, it's going to have important economic repercussions, that it's not just a matter of a technological fix. So to use the analogy, sometimes this analogy doesn't work well, but if we use the analogy to the epidemic right now, you know, it was... I mean, you knew that if you had to do a lockdown, this is going to have an impact on the economy. You couldn't keep going around and saying like, you know what, we're going to have a, a lockdown, but don't worry, people, the economy is going to continue working uh, like it's working. So we need to, to act on the virus and we need that this is going to have some economic repercussions. And then the governments, to the extent that they did, they didn't do it exactly. And they, they could have done much, much more now uh, of how to reallocate resources, how to make sure that people are supported in this difficult uh, period, how to make sure that uh, important goods are, are uh, provided to people at low cost. So there were many things that we would like to see governments to do. But for me, that's the model of what needs to be done with climate change. Uh, I don't mean lockdown, because there's no problem of going outside of our house as far as carbon emissions are concerned. But there is like an awareness that, you know, we have to intervene also in the economic sphere and we can't keep pretending that the economic sphere will just keep going as it's going, growing, and then we're just gonna make some fix uh, on the side. Uh, so again, when we did the lockdown, we didn't say we want to reduce the economy 6%, that it, it decreased this year, but that was uh, the outcome precisely of, of doing what needed to be done with the epidemic and not fully actually, no? Um, uh, so that's one part. Now about South Africa, I would say yes, that, uh, I think a very, a very important question there is like this discourse that I said about the growth, to what uh, alternative discourses to development does it speak to? Uh, my, my good colleague and friend Jason Hickel, um, who is from the region also, he's precisely thinking about like, and he has written a book recently on degrowth. He's, he's, he comes from development studies now, and he's precisely trying to think of uh, what meaning can the things we're talking about degrowth could they have in the context of South Africa? And how can they connect to political discussions, debates and alternatives that they have been going uh, for decades also in your part of the world? Okay, uh, as we are waiting for more questions, uh, okay, here is a good question, uh, again from Jules. Uh, is there any value in pushing individual behavior changes in degrowth? I feel that in Belgium or France, there is already a degrowth discourse, but what it is focused on, but which is focused on good behavior and even towards hermit-like lives detached from the rest of society. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that, that's what we try to articulate in, in our book, The Case for Degrowth, that I said very briefly. So we, we talk there about an articulation of the personal, the communal, and the political. So personal change is necessary. So we can't, uh, we can't pretend that we can just like do whatever we were doing, you know, and then we don't make any personal change and we say, okay, it's just the system that has to change. We're going to wait for the system to change and then 
So there is some value in the dictum that says like live, uh, start living in terms of the change uh, you want to see. Of course, not all of us have the privilege to be able to live differently and we don't have the flexibility. So we have to understand that this is also a privilege to fight for, um, to limit ourselves in a sense. Now that there are many people, the majority of people live day in, day out, even in the overdeveloped high, high income economies. And it's a matter of uh, having the options to, to live differently. So living differently is important. It is important in sense of starting this change, seeing, showing that it is possible, but also of cultivating what we call the common sense. Now that a different way of living is possible and is also happy. You're not like a miserable person uh, living this way. Now, if you do that, and you're right, uh, Jules, if you do that and you just isolate and you become a clan of uh, the growthers living the degrowth way outside and you, you're looked as hippies, you're not doing anything. The question is like you stay in society and that's the difficult part because then you start having uh, contradictions now because in order to be part of society, you have to play also by other rules and then you start having to deal with contradictions. You can't be a puritan, puritan in that sense. No? Uh, being the part of, of, of uh, society and com communalize that. So it's not just you, it's you and others that you create also common structures to thinking about here in Barcelona. There are cooperatives of food, for example, people who have self-organized and they bring their uh, food from local producers in the vicinity of Barcelona. And they've made cooperatives. So you live differently, you consume different food, uh, you spend your time differently, but you do it with others. And then others that might not be exactly the growthers or haven't read about the growth, say, okay, this cooperative actually uh, produces better food. No, I might join it just because I want healthier food. And then they join it and they get part of this process. And then there is the next level. So when they become part of this process, then you convince them also to vote for Ada Colau in the next elections, you know? <laughs> so you become also a political movement. Uh, so it's this articulation of the personal, the communal, and the political that it's crucial. So the personal is part of the equation. We shouldn't, um, we shouldn't underestimate it and we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't uh, just make fun of it many times now because people live differently. But we should criticize people who just live differently now because that's clearly not enough. I think the next question from uh, Sebastian almost follows on from this one uh, where Sebastian is asking, is it realistic for individual communities or cities to pursue degrowth strategies if they are embedded within a growth-focused capitalist national economy? Yeah, I mean that's yes, yes, that's uh, yes, that, that that's the, that's that's the most uh, difficult part now. So how, how does uh, how does change come about now, especially within a system that you have to grow or die, and even municipal authorities depend on revenue from from taxing profitable activity. So there is a whole set of imperatives within capitalist economy. So. Um, the question is like, how do, how do we say, how does a slow revolution unfold there? And I don't think I'm, I'm the best person to answer that. There are much bigger minds who have dealt with that. So the question applies to everyone who wants to see something different, uh, something different outside of capitalism or beyond capitalism emerging from within capitalism. So how do we move from here to there? And I don't think this is a question that applies uh, only to, to the growth. Uh, to the extent that we, as uh, in our degrowth books, we have tried to address with that. Uh, as I said, we have uh, articulated the... Uh, oh, oh, oh. Sorry, because my I see my, my, my power going down. Uh, we have articulated that... Uh, mm -hmm. I'll have to fix my 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 energy my my power <laughs> uh, when I finish the answer. Yeah, we have articulated in terms of uh, the different strategies of confrontation, but also cultural change because we don't believe in confrontation and political political change uh, without uh, cultural change, without having built uh, the mass of people that they want to see the political uh, change happening. Now, I, I don't think this will be a smooth process of just political process or electing, let's say a uh, like-minded municipal authorities in power that's not enough so it's gonna be through uh, conditions and circumstances not of our own choosing that we would have to be ready with the right ideas and the right political dynamics to let to to, to have that happen but i think we are entering a 
if we were to write uh, like Hobsbawm, no, had this very big period, no, uh, of hundred years. I mean, we are entering a period of disasters. It might be epidemic disaster, it might be climate disasters. Uh, that the conditions are going to change dramatically, and what is going to emerge there? I think we have to be a little bit less deterministic of what is going to be possible uh, within this context. I have a couple of small questions for you. One is, you know, sometimes you read uh, Portugal has sixty percent of its uh, energy consumption in twenty twenty came from renewables, or on certain days of, you know, in twenty seventeen it was fifty one percent. There are also information that you might get on a random day that the Netherlands today was hundred percent based on off grid production of energy and so forth. Yeah. So as a, I, I know, and I sort of agree with you that, you know, techno fixes such as let us make energy differently while doing the same things that we do, et cetera, you know, are, are in some ways not, 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 not the kind of way forward. But are these good measurements of transition from, let us say, the kind of energy reliance we have to a different kind of energy economy, because it has a lot of other implications as well. Mm -hmm. uh, including, for example, on living together and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. And the second one is that, you know, there are, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, in places like Belgium and so forth, there's a fair amount of experimentation. I can't hear you. Subir. Subir, you turned off your mic. What I'm saying is that in, in places like Brussels, uh, and I'm sure in many other places as well, there are lots of experiments for the urban commons which are going on. And we have normally thought of the commons as being rural or you know, somewhere remote, et cetera. Uh, and I see that in your closing slides, you were talking about uh, you know, kind of bringing the commons into the conversation as well. Mm -hmm. So you know, most of the world's population is now urban. Uh, more than 50%, uh, that is likely to, uh, you know, uh, sort of increase further. How do you see this kind of dynamic? This is my second question, which is that the uh, commons has to be thought of increasingly as an urban thing rather than how we naturally or, you know, traditionally have thought of it as a rural thing. Yeah. Um, no, renewable energy, I think, is... Uh, is uh... What's the Latin thing? Sina quo, no, no, I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah. can't do without it, no? Uh, so I'm not questioning that. But I mean, the figures you're saying is just a single day. If you take it throughout the year, and it's, it's a day that, you know, there was a lot of sun, the network just needed that, demand must supply. I mean, the big problem with renewables is, for example, storage, you know, that they produce a lot of energy when you don't need it, and they don't produce when you need it. So you have to need to still run other sources that they need to, to run uh, all the time. Uh, so the question is not whether we need renewables, we need renewables, of course, but the question is like, is it easier to do that with the current energy use that we use and try to decarbonize the system? Or it's going to be easier with uh, two or four times more within 30 years, which is like what 3% growth per year means like, and this is where we're, we're, we're asked for a question. Uh, Julia Steinberger and colleagues have shown, for example, that um, we can satisfy basic needs uh, of a global population or basic needs in energy with a fraction of the energy that is being used uh, mm. right now of course in a let's say in a sufficient matter not not with a, with excesses of energy etc and it's um, it's it's like a thought experiment or a mathematical model exercise no but it shows that there is a lot of scope of of also reducing energy use and in doing so making easier let's say the job of uh, decarbonizing the energy supply because right now uh, the job of decarbonizing an energy supply that keeps growing at 3% per year is like, uh, it's, it's like impossible. I've used the metaphor, you try to run mm. uphill on a downward scale that goes faster and faster, you know, it's like <laughs> after you go at the same speed, impossible. Um, commons, yes, the way I understand commons, uh, maybe didn't come out clear in my talk, uh, I understand on a more expanded notion, which I think is the way most scholars of the commons now, or at least the scholars I like, talk about it. So yes, the initial commons studied by Eleanor Ostrom were rural, were like uh, pre-capitalist commons or let's say outside of capitalism commons, not things that they were done outside users coming together to do things. I think there is now a much more expanded understanding and interesting 
theory of the commons as commoning now, people coming together and sharing resources and creating self-institutions of self-governance mm. uh, at a variety of scales and places from rural areas and resources to thinking about something like uh, Wikipedia or uh, the Linux system to thinking about uh, occupied squares uh, or settlements for helping refugees mm. or um, an occupied school or um, an urban garden. No? So, and I think it's it's really analytically potent and politically potent to start thinking of these things mm. as commons. And the fact that it's politically potent, again, going back to my city in Barcelona, perhaps I went very fast through that, but that it is politically potent it is evident that the movement that emerged here out of all these initiatives, which is in a city, there are city initiatives now of mm. alternative economies, cooperatives, etc. Mm. Uh, and actually, the mayor was an activist of trying to stop uh, house evictions now after the financial crisis of 2008. The framing that this political movement took was a party for the commons. Mm. And many of the things that it tried to do was to communalize or cooperativize. Uh, infrastructures of the city. So I, I do think that's a very potent uh, analytically and politically way of thinking around the commons. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, okay, here is one from Carlos T. Uh, the last book by David, uh, David Bollier and Silke Helfrich is quite good on the commons. Uh, it links the commons to the pluriverse as well. Uh, thanks very much, there, uh, Carlos. Actually, I'm writing on the Commons and I didn't know about this, so I'm going to steal that reference from you. Let me quickly cut and paste. Um, okay. Uh, uh, any further questions from uh, you know uh, that you would like to ask uh, Yorgos before he goes off to his one-year-old twins? Okay. If if uh, if there is nothing else coming, then I'd like to thank you very much, Yorgos, for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure, uh, you know, because uh, we had, you know, some interactions while you were here and I can see some of the ideas that we were talking about in those days coming out. Maybe that came out in actually... No, let, let me say something, let me say something. I didn't say the anecdote that actually the idea for the Malthus book was born from a, from a lecture on the same uh, seminar series that I'm now, the development uh, studies one. So there was a lecturer who, she had, I think, the same title. She was, Why Malthus Was Wrong. Uh, but she, she, she gave an explanation that I didn't agree with, you know. Uh, so she gave the, she gave the, it was a socialist take, it was on Venezuela and Cuba and was saying like, okay, well, Malthus was wrong because he didn't see that actually socialist government can produce a lot and then there is not scarcity, you know. Uh, and I said, I agree to her up to a point, but then I didn't agree with the final steps he took. And, yeah. uh, and then I went back home and I was like, I want to write something about it. Then I talked to Gareth Dale, who told me, have you read the essay of Malthus? You know, he actually is a growthist. He's not. <laughs> and, uh, and then my wife told me, you, you know, you have to read a book that you feel really passionate about. And then I said, okay, that's what I feel passionate about, Malthus. And all this constant argument, even by people that politically, I feel I'm part of the same thing, that they reproduce the same argument about Malthus and the response that I find as problematic. So the very seminar we are now might be the beginning of a book for someone who disagrees uh, vehemently with me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do seminars for, so that people can be the speaker and finish writing a book. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much there. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be in touch with you uh, regarding some of what you said, uh, because obviously, you know, as you can imagine, there's a lot of interest in this sort of thing within our students and our colleagues. And I wish you all the best. It's very nice to see you after quite a while. And, uh, Take care and have a good rest of the evening. And thanks to everyone who joined in, uh, you know, to listen to this excellent talk. Uh, as I said, there will be a recording of this available soon on YouTube. I'll send you, uh, you know, Yorgos, uh, a link to that one. Okay. Thank you, Subir, and thanks everyone for staying. Okay. Take care then, everyone. Bye bye. 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 bye.